Welcome to Catalyst, a program about people, ideas, issues, and conversations around them. Welcome to Catalyst. I'm Doug Webster, your host of the STEM education series, A Renewed Culture of Innovation. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. This series was developed to discuss key issues around stimulating interest in technology, creativity, and innovation, and to, to help strengthen science, engineering, and technology education. Today's episode is the, the new electronics, enabling all of us to be makers. We have Jeff Branson from the Department of Education at SparkFun Electronics as our guest. SparkFun has been a leader in helping supply the maker movement and provide professional development to teachers and the community. This is Jeff's second visit to the show. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks for having me back, Doug. It's great to be here. Great. Can you tell us uh, what's different about electronics these days? Well, I think the major difference, if we look at it compared to, let's say, 25 years ago, is that programming has taken such a, a large portion of it up. What we used to solve with hardware is now sol solved through software. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so learning coding, in some ways, is a lot easier than learning how to do basic electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. OK, what are some of the emerging platforms, devices? Can you well, give I us think some they're examples? the devices that we're all familiar with, and then a, a few others. Uh, if we had to look at the fastest growth right now, it's probably around Arduino, which is a small mm -hmm. open source microcontroller, uh, about eight times faster and eight times more powerful than the computer that sent men to the moon. Uh, we also see a lot of stuff coming out of mobile applications, out of Android um, and, and some of the applications that you can write for either Android or an iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, so those, these things are kind of sharing the market. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a couple of clips we want to show, your pictures, I guess. Sure, so yeah, I'll talk want, a little bit about some those? of the stuff that okay. we're working with. Uh, if we can bring up the clips, I'll kind of do a little bit of description on each one. Um, take that first photograph. This is actually an Arduino built without the supporting development board. And uh, it has an attached LED, which I can run a test program and blink that LED. And it tells me that I'm actually getting code onto the chip. Uh, it's plugged in through the USB port. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, what you'll see is the series of wires actually provide power and ground and the communication path to the programming environment on my laptop. Uh, next to those connection wires is actually a little oscillator that provides the clock signal. So this is kind of the most bare bones embedded computing that you can do putting a chip into something and then leaving it there mm -hmm. rather than having the, the computing going on offshore. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, could we have the next one? So I've been recently involved in a lot of open source motion control stuff, uh, CNC. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that happened is that my wife said, hey, can you build an embroidery machine? And uh, we have this beautiful old Nietzsche Italian sewing machine. Mm -hmm. And there's a new power supply. Um, 24 volt power supply to run stepper motors. So we're endeavoring to hook this up to a two axis motion control system so we can do embroidery out of, let's say, Inkscape, mm -hmm. um, commonly available free program. Um, could we have the next picture, please? This is uh, a 3D router that came off of Craigslist. This is uh, run through an open source Linux motion control system. Uh, the platform of this router is about 16 by 24, and you can do something about three and a half inches high. But I've been using this to try to explore the whole motion control system so that we can open this up to schools to create their own CNC uh, and open source tooling that's very cost effective and very easy to access from the component level. So those are some examples of uh, the higher end of electronics. Uh -huh. um, there's a lot of stuff around embedded computing and programming on board the boards that, that's also being done. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of boards, it, we, you have uh, several boards right in front of you. you I brought a bunch of my you, toys with me. On there? So uh, this is the Arduino. And if you've read Make Magazine or Wired or been into Radio Shack or been to our website, uh, you've probably seen this. 
This is a small microcontroller, and this one's a surface mount. The one that we showed earlier in the clip is actually a through-hole pin mount. This is slightly different, but has exactly the same functionality. All the tiny pins on this are broken out to these little ports so I can plug a wire in there, and I can program through a USB port all of the functionalities built onto the board. It's very fast, very easy. We've been mm -hmm. using this programming with as low as fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade, to teach mm -hmm. kids either drag and drop or text-based programming. And then once I load the program on here, it lives on the board, and I provide it anywhere between 3.3 and 16 volts, and so this will continue to run that program. So fourth and fifth grade. Fourth and fifth grade. Great. Great. Yeah, we're, we've been having a blast with the young kids, awesome. seeing where this goes. Um, we were told we couldn't do it, and we didn't know if we could, but we gave it a shot, and it worked great. 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 What else do you have there? So the next thing is we've seen a renaissance in wireless control, and this is a 900 megahertz wireless unit. We used this mm -hmm. in a project that emerged at the Vermont Mini Maker Fair. Mm -hmm. This has a range of 8 to 15 miles. We tethered this to a weather balloon along with an Arduino board, a very small Arduino board, and we were doing data logging from a tethered weather balloon. So uh -huh. we would get temperature, wind speed, relative humidity on some of the balloons that we were sending up. We were getting a three-axis accelerometer, very dynamic data. And then Jen Carson from Vermont mm -hmm. Makers was taking that stuff and doing some art projects with the data. So we mm -hmm. were creating interactive environments based on data logging. So this wireless unit is... I think 40 or $50, uh, it might be less, I can't actually remember, but very accessible, uh, programmable through a laptop, uh, so I can get, you know, get data from remote sites right. without wire. Right, so you're essentially using that to do a problem-based learning exercise, uh, capturing data, analyzing the data, and then what? charting it, grab... Yeah, what, doing, um, yeah. doing all the yeah. problem solving that we see done in industry and academics and, mm -hmm. and institutional settings that was introduced much later kind of in the educational trajectory. Now, because this stuff is so ubiquitous, so cheap and so easy to use, we can introduce this early on, middle and high school. Uh, when we were done with the weather balloon project, I was out on the West Coast and this actually went to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for a meeting about NASA education's efforts um, and this mirrors right. what we do with satellites. Yeah, yeah. Now, what can you can you describe more about that uh, JPL visit? Sure. Yeah. Um, we were Talk invited more. by some of the mission architecture people from the Curiosity mission. Uh -huh. um, they use some of the parts from the firm I work for to develop stuff. So they said, "We know you're going to be in California. Would you like to come to JPL? And while you're here, our education people are interested in talking to you." So we went out to JPL, we toured JPL, we got to see uh, all, all the fun stuff that is JPL, and uh, it's yeah. really an amazing place. Uh, and then we sat down with NASA Education and talked about some of our efforts, some of my personal projects, the Weather Balloon Project with Vermont Makers, it ends up is a wonderful way to model systems telemetry, um, lower satellites, and networking for a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So we can take mm -hmm. this uh, and we actually broached the subject with NASA about trying to find funding for public schools to do work on this at the middle and high school level so that by the time kids reach university grant structures, they've got a much more advanced vocabulary. Uh, we also took in some robotic stuff, wireless robotics control using uh, first-person view from wireless cameras to mirror things like the Curiosity mission architecture. The example of that would be that uh, we'd create maybe somewhere else in the school a, a different location from the classroom setting, we'd create a course or uh, some kind of playground and the kids would build a robot without ever seeing where it was going. The teacher would then place the robot on that remote course. The student would never have any first-hand knowledge of the course. They would only get what they got through the monitor, through the video monitor mounted on the robot and the sensor array. And then we would issue yeah. them mission parameter sheets and they would have to go through the course remotely navigating and gathering data. And it's very similar to what we do when we send things to other planets. Yeah. So this is an interesting model for us to be able to take to NASA and again we Very. can put these things together for, for a really reasonable budget, give them to classrooms and simulate real world problem solving and this is this extends to dangerous environments on earth, um, underwater robotics, there's a whole lot of other applications. Um, sure, sure. Yeah. Now uh, electronics traditionally has been uh, taught in an electronics classroom. Uh, 
we're, we're talking about other applications and, and all kinds of different disciplines. Can you give us some examples of like, for, for instance, agriculture? Sure. What, what is an application for this in, a, in an agriculture setting? Well, these wireless modules are ideal for remote locations in agriculture. Uh, if I wanted to, let's say, take a quadcopter and monitor a herd without ever leaving the house, I can do this wirelessly, put a camera on it, run it out into the field, check the cows, make sure they're all right, make sure that the, water's, the water tank's open, um, there's uh, temperature data, I can, I can mount one of these things at a remote site, am I getting food to the cattle, am I getting, you know, is the water at a certain temperature, uh, I can do herd counting if we uh, make a gate that only passes one cow at a time, I can count the number of cows who come back and forth through a certain point, um, do herd management that way. Of course, the, uh, the applications in terms of barns and doing temperature control and environmental monitoring in barns, that's really great if I put a pressure sensor underneath uh, each stall. R really simple thing. I can look at the weight of the cows as they come in every right. night. Um, right. So we can do a lot, an awful lot with this. Right, um, right. Now, now would this, it, it, like for example, with you're in an agriculture class, would it make sense for students in that class to be familiar with this technology? I, I mean, that's kind of a yeah, silly question. So, um, I'm going to go back to basic systems because so much of what we run today is, the average car has 6 to 11 microcontrollers in it. Right. So if we teach kids this, and we're talking about farm equipment, just the ability to troubleshoot and work with the farm equipment, the highly expensive farm equipment that people are working with now, those, th that opens up a whole new world of stuff. Uh, yep. We've been working with the CAN bus on automobiles uh, and remote data logging so that we can take data off the vehicle sensor system and send it when, it when we get in sight of a wireless network that we recognize, we can send that data to it and data log it. So now I'm looking at engine management parameters and I'm getting um, vehicle life kind of signatures on that stuff. So there's a lot of applications just in terms of farm equipment. Right, um, so right. Yeah. Now you mentioned quadcopter. Yeah. What, can you describe what a quad, quadcopter is? Uh, so the yeah. quadcopter that I'm working on, and I know that uh, we had some at the Mini Maker Fair, yes, but did. the quadcopter yeah. I'm working on is uh, roughly three feet in diameter. Um, it has four rotors. It's a model airplane. Um, those four rotors give it a lot of stability, but at the same time maneuverability in all three axes. Uh, and these have been used in a bunch of different applications, search and rescue. Um, they're being used for remote, remote data gathering. Um, they're using them in pipeline applications to fly pipelines without sending people out um, and examine to see if those pipelines are in good condition. So these quadcopters are kind of um, coming up in a whole bunch of different areas. We see swarms of them working in concert now to do construction projects. Um, and you can buy a simple quadcopter off Amazon now for about $300 that links straight to an iPad. Wow. So you can fly it right from an so iPad. You can fly it and you can see what, you can, the yeah, camera. You, and, yeah, a little yeah. camera on it. And yeah. uh, so uh, so the, the kind of new electronics in that quadcopter, uh, it, it's yeah. making a whole world of stuff available to us that wasn't yeah. available before. Now you, now, you had an example of a um, vulture? Was it a vulture? We've been uh, really lucky. About six weeks ago, I got a call from a friend in Boulder who said they'd been approached by the Denver Zoo. and. The idea is they're trying to tag endangered Mongolian vultures. And the vultures typically nest high up on cliff sides. Uh, the proposal with the quadcopter is that when the vulture hears the noise of the copter, it hunkers down in the nest. And friends of ours in California have built a heavy lift quadcopter. As the vulture hunkers down in the nest, the quadcopter comes in and hovers over it and drops a weighted net on it. So this way, researchers can get to the vulture, tag the vulture before it would fly away. Of course, if they approach before, the vulture would just fly away. But they can tag it and then release it. So this is oh, under cool. development right now. We're looking at all this, doing feasibility studies. And uh, actually, uh, we, we're just we're trying to get uh, our timing together at the Denver Zoo to do a test with the live vultures at the zoo. Wow, cool. Cool. Uh, now, what else do you have down here? OK. You, you have more this devices is a to show us. Papilio board, and this is a form of a computer called a field programmable gate array 
and this is an ultra fast computer moving basically at the speed of light but it's also base level configuration I can build because this is just transistors um, I can build any system I want on this field programmable gate array so the difference about this is that this has typically been a very advanced programming language, but emerging with this one, the Papilio, are environments where people with a moderate level of expertise in computer programming can now enter into field programmable gate arrays, and we can do very, very fast computation with mm -hmm. them. So this is a really great thing for us in terms of expanding into education, getting kids building uh, super fast instrumentation. We have friends at the Colorado School of Mines who built scanning electron microscopes with these. Mm. So, um, and uh, they're doing a whole lot of really fun stuff with lasers, scanning electron microscopes at the ultra-fast optics lab out great. there. Great. Uh, next to that yeah. is, uh, this is a yo-yo. And this is a microcontroller that sockets to the Android phone system, mm -hmm. uh, and it is built to work in the Eclipse development environment. So the layering is much more simple for developing straight through applications, maybe gathering the sensor data off the Android phone and data logging it to someplace, doing tracking, uh, tying it into social networks, or vice versa, sending instructions to the Android phone from a remote application, and this acquires the Android through a Bluetooth module. Mm -hmm. So I've uh, been working not only on this system, but also taking uh, the straight Arduino and taking the communication ports on the straight Arduino and hooking them up to simple wireless modules like this one um, and going straight from Arduino in and out of the Android phone and developing stuff for middle and high school education with the Android system and, and really simple hardware so mm -hmm. that kids can go in and use App Inventor, which is a free program from MIT, to develop Android applications and then do wireless control from a phone to, let's say, a robot. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about actually going now with that wireless stuff straight from the weather balloon rather than going to an Arduino and then a web connection straight to phones. So uh -huh. we could launch one of these weather balloons at a public event, let's say a Maker Faire, and then people could look at the data real time on their phone with an app that, let's say, a high school class built. Mm -hmm. So it gives us real time access, first person access to the uh, data. Great, great. New networks. Great. Now, yeah, you've got a couple more devices. A couple more. I've, uh, um, this is uh, uh, what we call a bit whacker. And what this uh -huh. does is uh, emulate a parallel port. And we don't see a lot of parallel ports on laptops anymore, and we certainly don't see them. But what I can do is make a USB connection to this and send serial data into it and emulate a parallel port and do motion control. And this brings us full circle to the early discussions of motion control being able to build our own kind of CNC machines out of it. Uh, uh -huh. We could do a lathe or a CNC mill flame cutting like plasma or, uh, or traditional flame cutting uh, embroidery work yeah. straight, straight out of this device. So uh, I've been doing a lot of work personally um, in tying this into larger scale motion control stuff and out of non-traditional platforms. Mm -hmm. So okay, great. great. Now you already covered that one, right? That one? I did. Yeah, yeah this that was, was good. Yep, wireless okay. shield for Android. So in addition to all of this, uh, we're doing a lot of stuff with 3D printing. Yeah. And I don't know how much, I, I know that Vermont Makers has an, uh, an upcoming meetup on 3D printing. Yeah. Yeah. But we're doing a lot of work using some of the motion control stuff, not only from the earlier stuff that we talked about, but from the Bitwhacker to, uh, to be able to allow people to build their own 3D printers uh -huh. um, in the yeah. configurations they want to. And uh, I'm working with my wife on getting 3D printing into elementary school classes. Yep. So what we're doing is taking uh, the new electronics and combining them with traditional studio arts, drafting, drawing, um, and sculpting, yeah. and teaching kids how to use things like SketchUp uh, to do 3D printing and, and build their own objects in the classroom. Right, so it, all this integrates really well with the arts and other disciplines. Yeah, we've had I mean, a just tremendous yeah, crossover from the arts, and yeah. what we're really starting to see uh, it, from the educational perspective is, uh, is that the arts inform a lot of what we do now, because we have these machines that are so easy to use and approximate 
human learning so well that we can start to engage in the higher level stuff, the arts and humanities. And a lot of the discussion that I have with people where they say, where do I start? What do I do with these electronics? And, and what would be my approach in? And I say, you know, read Homer, listen to Hank Williams, do a little uh, look at calculus, and then go teach it to a machine. Because what we're engaged in in a lot of ways is machine learning. Yeah. So learn, learn who, what humans do and then go teach it to machines. So I, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about some of our stuff with Google. We're also mm -hmm. working with Google yep. Interactive Spaces. Uh, there's a new program uh, through Google Interactive Spaces which embeds the Connect controller in the ceiling of a room, and there are actually a number of them embedded in the ceiling of a room. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to the Google Welcome Center uh, in Mountain View, and there are a couple of other worldwide, but this will acquire you uh, as an entity and you can do gesture control, the room uh, adjusts to you in terms of lighting, you can see your footprint as a colored shape on the floor of the room. Uh, so we're starting to discover how we take these sensor networks and link them to larger computational environments. Now we talked about education and ap application and education, now what about economic development, product development? I mean that's ultimately where we're going with this, isn't it? Well, it's interesting, and uh, this has been a, a, an ongoing discussion about where this heads in terms of product development and long-term economic growth. Uh, we feel like the innovation economy is, is one of, you know, to, to use an off-quoted phrase, of one of the new engines. And what this does yeah. is it gives the individual empowerment to take this technology and develop as they see fit personally without a lot of personal investment. If we look at older economic models, what happens is people have to buy large-scale equipment. Uh, this right. is fairly cheap equipment. Most of this stuff is under $100, um, and the development environments are readily accessible to people. Uh, we've been talking to libraries about putting hardware in libraries to make these developments available through the library setting so that everybody has access to it. Yeah. Um, and we yeah. look at the innovation economy mirrors, in some ways, early American agrarian economies in terms of the exactly. fact that it's owner-producers um, right. doing very small-scale individualized operations. Right, exactly. Now we had a clip here we wanted to show. Do okay. you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, okay. This is from the autonomous vehicle race two years ago at SparkFun. Every year for the last four years we've hosted an autonomous vehicle race. Uh, this vehicle race is Homemade vehicles from people from literally all over the world. Uh, two years ago, I had a high school team here, and we were sitting next to a group of gentlemen from Africa. Uh, you're seeing ground vehicles here. These are all autonomous. Nobody's driving these. They have GPS on them and sensor arrays. And as you can see, there's a, there is some mayhem involved. Uh, mm -hmm. When robots go bad, this is what it looks like. Um, but some, some of them are quite remarkable. Um, and we had last year, somebody made it around our building in under 30 seconds. Um, mm -hmm. So it's quite a feat. We do both aerial and ground vehicles um, in all scales and sizes. Uh, so SparkFun, uh, you know, we do this, we put this out there and it developed from the DARPA Grand Challenge, which six or seven years ago uh, was a DARPA funded research project to get autonomous vehicles. And we thought, well, we, we have a community of people who are capable of doing that with the new. Uh -huh. So we founded this, and uh, we run it every year. Cool. Last year, we got about 1,000 people. This year, it's so big, we're going to have to move off the spark fund grounds. Wow. So we've had a blast with it. We love doing it. It's one of the big things that we do, and uh, we look forward to it every year. Uh, this year, I, yeah. uh, I've got a full-size Dalek, the creatures from the Doctor Who series. Okay. We tried to run it last year. We had some problems um, historically. Internal entries in AVC get the last attention. You know, we're so busy running the event that uh, we had it going last year, but it went too, too fast and we couldn't control it. So okay. we kept it out. Okay, well, you work on that one, eh? Yeah. Uh, you know, as far as acquiring this technology and so forth, short of being an SparkFun infomercial. Uh, right. Where right. where do people require this? Uh, well, um, uh, well, I'll start with other resources. Um, 
a little more freed, Adafruit in New York, you can get it from them. Of course, you, you can get it from us. Uh, Seed Studios is very cheap. What we try to do is provide tutorials, example projects, schematics yeah. for stuff. Um, the web is a wonderful resource. In Arduino.cc, um, Arduino developed in Italy. It was a product of the Technical Institute in Avrea. So the Arduino.cc website is a wonderful resource just to kind of check it out. Um, other resources, processing.org, the processing language is a wonderful place for people to start without any hardware investment at all. It's free, it's open mm -hmm. source, it's extremely well documented, so you can download it. Uh, there's a website called Processing and Interactivity for Educators. If you Google Processing and Interactivity for Educators, you'll get my friend Derek's website uh, from the Hillsborough Public School System in Oregon, and he has a complete curriculum laid mm -hmm. out for middle school kids. It's free, it's open source, you just go use it. Uh, we also, other resources, um, the Scratch language, we love Scratch for elementary school kids, mm -hmm. and this is an open source drag and drop programming environment. It's free, it's available from uh, scratch.org, I believe. It's mm -hmm. part of the MIT Media Lab, came out of the MIT Media okay. Lab. Um, so that's uh, another resource people can use. We use SketchUp for a ton of stuff. Um, so we're mm -hmm. very oriented towards the open source movement. Yes, yes. Um, and so when I talk about open source, I'm talking about stuff where the source code is available. If you don't like the way that the program functions, you can go in and change it. Mm -hmm. um, it treats information in a way that's non-proprietary. Uh, also, all of uh, the hardware that we build in-house that's red, anything that you see that's red, that's SparkFun, is mm -hmm. open source hardware. The schematics are available online. You can produce this hardware yourself. Uh, what we ask is attribution. Um, we're trying to move towards a new way of looking at knowledge, mm -hmm. that knowledge shouldn't be held hostage, that it's available to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. We do produce durable goods, and that's what we charge for, but we try not to charge for the wisdom behind it. Great, great. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Doug. It's great to be back in Vermont. My guest today was Jeff Branson. Jeff is with SparkFun Electronics, and today was showing us the new and exciting world of electronics and how we can participate. For more information about this show, related internet links, and other shows in this series, go to retn.org and look for Makers. Thank you for joining us.